So my name is Stephen Mullen. I, I'm a neurologist. I'm also a clinical lecturer now at, um, now at the University of Plymouth, working with Camille Carroll. But I, I, I spent more years than perhaps I, I care to remember at, um, at UCL, um, working with Professor Shapira, um, and, and um, had a lot of contact with both Tom and Annette over the years. And, and I'm going to talk about the Embroxel trial, but also a little bit about some of the background into um, genetic forms of Parkinson's. Um, and, you know, talk a little bit about what's a really exciting era for these types of trials, but equally some of the challenges that, that, that we face in order to be able to deliver these types of, of clinical trials. Um, and I guess it's appropriate to start back in 1998 when I um, was still at school, actually. Um, but this was the first indication that actually genetics were important in Parkinson's up to that point. Everyone had said, no, the genetics have no role in Parkinson's. This is your sporadic disease, as it was called, i.e. there was no element of genetics involved with it. And then all of a sudden, this family in Italy turned up. And very interestingly, they seemed to get Parkinson's generation upon generation upon generation. And when that happens, it strongly implies that there's a gene involved in some way or another. Um, and it was this gene that no one had ever heard of called alpha synuclein. Um, and everyone was like, gosh, you know, how interesting. Um, what's, what's alpha synuclein do? Um, but then everyone got really excited because what they found is that not only did this gene called alpha synuclein seem to um, lead, when there was a mutation in it, to Parkinson's generation upon generation upon generation, but even more impressive was that actually if you looked at the brains of people with Parkinson's, the protein which was encoded by that gene seemed to be present in large quantities in these things called Lewy bodies, which are these little blobs that you can see in, people's, in people with Parkinson's disease in their brains. Um, and so everyone got very excited and thought they'd cracked it. Um, because if you can identify a gene that is implicated in a disease, there is, is, there is the possibility that you can intervene in the pathway that leads to that gene and hopefully stop the progression of the disease. But then everyone came down to earth. And unfortunately, the reality was that mutations in this um, gene called alpha synuclein were vanishingly rare. So if you're a Parkinson's expert and you see patients in clinic, you'll be lucky to see one of these patients in your entire career because they are that rare. And actually, in retrospect, it's not all that surprising. And the reason it's not all that surprising is because people don't get Parkinson's generation upon generation upon generation. People, get Parkin people who get Parkinson's are likely to have a family history of Parkinson's. So if you have a family history of Parkinson's, you're about three or four times more likely to develop Parkinson's. But it's very rare to see families who get it generation upon generation upon generation. And in the, in the 40s, which is it, when people tend to get, tended to get Parkinson's if they had this mutation in this gene called alpha synuclein. And about this time, another story started to come up, and it was from a very interesting story. And it was in a group of patients who were a very rare group of patients who had this disease called Gaucher disease. Now, in the UK, there's about 300 patients in total who have this disease, so it's very rare. But what was noticed is that in this group of patients who had this very rare disease, um, there seemed to be an awful lot of people who were getting Parkinson's. And even more interestingly, there seemed to be an awful lot of people who were related to this group of patients who were also getting Parkinson's. And that tipped the interest of people. And people thought, well, maybe there is something about this gene called GBA that might be involved in the development of Parkinson's. Maybe it's a risk factor for Parkinson's. And actually, it turns out that that's exactly the case. So if we look up here, you've got all of these genes, including alpha synuclein, just there, which are very rare, which if you possess one of them, there is a very good chance that you will get Parkinson's and the Parkinson's will be passed down in your family from generation to generation. And then you have these group of conditions in the middle, including GBA, which are not, which are not too rare, but not too common either and which increase your risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Um, and in fact, 
that risk is, so if you took 100 people who carry one of these GBA mutations, by the age of 80, about 10 of them will develop Parkinson's disease. So actually, if you have one of these genes, it's far more likely you won't develop Parkinson's than you will develop Parkinson's disease. But even more interestingly, these mutations are actually very, very common. So in the UK, about 5% of patients with Parkinson's will carry one of these mutations. If you go to areas where there are lots of Ashkenazi Jews, like New York or Israel or indeed North London, then that proportion is higher. And actually in Israel, about 20% of people who have Parkinson's have one of these mutations. Um, so I should apologise in advance for this slide. It was only after I put it together and my wife looked at it last night that she said that it does bear a certain re resemblance to a certain 1980s computer game. It was completely <laughs> unintentional. <laughs> um, so um, I th it'd be useful at this point to go into a little bit about what we think is going on with this gene that seems to be mean that people are predisposed to getting Parkinson's disease. So GBA is an enzyme. And the best, most common kind of example of an enzyme that you may have come across is in biological washing powder. That enzyme takes down, um, takes um, protein, which is, um, which is kind of in the form of dirt on your clothes, and it breaks it down into smaller particles that can be washed away by your washing machine. And that's exactly the same as GBA does. And that's, you know, and people have talked a lot about waste disposal and getting rid of... Well, that's, that's exactly what this is. GBA is an enzyme that breaks things down. It breaks down this substrate, which is called glucosylceramide, which is kind of fat. And it breaks it down into um, ceramide and water, which can then be disposed of by the body. Um, but what's really interesting is that... Um, if you have a situation where you have a mutation in the GBA gene, then the ability of this enzyme to do that seems to be reduced. And even more interesting than that, in cells, in experiments in the, um, in, in the laboratory, if you either inhibit the activity of this enzyme or you look at people who have mutations that cause the activity of this enzyme to be reduced, the amount of alpha-synuclein, now remember that is... The, that protein that's present in the brains of people with Parkinson's and that in the 1990s no one really had a clue what it was, well that seems to go up. Quite how that happens we don't really know yet, but there seems to be something interlinked about the amount of alpha synuclein present and the activity of this enzyme. And what's more, it's not just people who have mutations in this gene that seem to be affected. As Richard mentioned, in the brains of people who have Parkinson's who don't carry one of these mutations, if you measure the activity of this enzyme, it seems to be reduced. And the same goes if you look at the cerebrospinal fluid. So that's the fluid that flows around the brain. So there's something about this enzyme, and we don't know quite what it is, that if it's not working properly, seems to predispose you to getting Parkinson's. And that's where this drug Ambroxol came in. Um, now, I remember when we first heard about this drug, um, we were all like, Ambroxol, what the hell's Ambroxol? But it was quite funny because we had um, a German NSC student in the lab. So in the continent, everyone's heard of this because it's a cough syrup and you can buy it over the counter. And everyone was like, what's this Ambroxol thing? It was after a journal club. And to our amazement, she opened her handbag and took a load of lozenges out, which were <laughs> Ambroxol lozenges. <laughs> and, and I guess the point that I'm making is that it's a really common drug in the continent. It's been used safely with very few side effects for many years, which is really, really exciting. And the reason it came, it became, piqued the interest of the research community is in the, some years ago, a group of researchers in America took a, what's called a library of about 10,000 drugs, and basically they chucked it at a test tube and they measured the activity of this enzyme. And they looked for any drugs that seemed to increase the activity of this enzyme, and Ambroxol was one of them. And so it was brought forward as a drug that might be of use in Parkinson's and also this other condition called Gaucher disease. And what seems to happen with Ambroxol is, well, it binds to the enzyme and it seems to partially reverse the dysfunction of the enzyme, which allows Pac-Man to start working again. And very interestingly, 
also seems to reduce the amount of alpha-synuclein um, that is in the, the test tube. So that increase of alpha-synuclein seems to be reversed if you add ambroxyl into the mix, which is very encouraging because it implies that maybe we might be able to take this research done in the lab and we might be able to transfer it to patients and maybe slow down the progression of Parkinson's disease. And so that was the theory underlying AMPD, the Am Ambroxyl in the Modification of Parkinson's Disease Trial, um, which is completed and was a study of about 18 patients, um, about half with GBA mutations and half without. And the rationale for that was because we wanted to see if whatever effects we saw might be seen in both groups of patients because of the evidence that it might have applicability that I mentioned before. The trial wasn't a trial looking to see whether the drug worked, i.e. whether it, um, whether it improved the clinical course, because it's what's called underpowered to do that. It doesn't have enough people to show that. Its primary objective was to show that it got into the brain, um, to show that it changed the activity of the enzyme, and also um, to see whether it had any other effects that would imply that it seems to be doing what we hope it's doing. Um, it was a dose, it, it was, a, the design of the study was the dose of ambroxyl was increased gradually. People had ambroxyl for about six months, and then we took a s s sample of cerebrospinal fluid before and at six months as well. Um, now, as Richard um, and Simon have mentioned, this study is very close to publication, and we hope it will be published very soon, but unfortunately the results are still under embargo. Although what I can say is that the results are very encouraging. Um, and I can tell you as well that we think it does get into the brain. Um, and we think that it's doing some of the things we hoped it's doing. But watch this space for a bit more detail on that, hopefully within the next month or so. Um, but that brings, and just to sort of emphasise that we're not the only people interested in this, this is a group in Canada who are running a much larger study. This one is looking to see whether it has a clinical effect in the context of memory, because patients who have these mutations seem to disproportionately have their memory affected compared to other Parkinson's patients. But interestingly, there are lots and lots of other clinical trials using similar but not the same pathway targeting the GBA gene. This is another study called MOOSPD. This is a multinational study run by Sanofi, which is a large pharmaceutical company, over many sites, which is costing an enormous amount of money, looking to see whether they can modify the course of Parkinson's as well. And quite recently, there was an announcement of a major gene therapy study. So that is a study where people are giving a, um, a viral vector, which is aiming to modify the genes within the brain to see if they are able to change the activity of the enzyme that way. So there is an awful lot of interest, both from the commercial and the non-commercial sector, in GBA Parkinson's, as there is in genetic forms of Parkinson's in general. But there's a snag. And it's quite a major snag, because for the last 20 years, we've been telling Parkinson's patients there's no point in getting genotyped, because there's no, nothing we can do about it. It's just going to cause problems, and it's going to you know, complicate matters. And that's changing a bit, because we are, we are on the cusp of having clinical trials where actually these therapies are designed specifically at people with genetic mutations. That's precision medicine that Tom was talking about. But as we found out to our cost, recruiting for these studies is hard because there just aren't the patients available to go into them. And had it not been for Tom Faultney and Professor, Professor Limerson, who were close collaborators on the NPD trial, we certainly wouldn't have had the numbers to be able to do it. And that's because they are one of the few people, groups of people in the country who have a ready pool of genotype patients. And so we need to look ahead to the next few years for the next phase of the Ambroxyl trial, hopefully, but also to other clinical trials, to look to see, to build up the capacity to be able to deliver these trials and not hold up the potential of these drugs just because we can't get people into these clinical trials. And that's where this study, which I'm going to talk a little bit about at the end here today, called PD Frontline. And this is an initiative which is part funded by the Pure Parkinson's Trust, which is to try and deliver um, this aim of genotyping people ready for these trials. And it's very simple. 
people log on to the website, pdfrontline.com. Um, they sign a consent form online, reading all the documentation, which gives a bit of information about some of the things you need to consider when taking a genetic test. Answer about five minutes of questions, very light touch, just so that we get a sense of who, you know, who, who they are and what kind of trials they might be eligible for. They give a saliva sample, which they send back in a stamped addressed envelope. And then a few weeks later, we will either email or contact them with the result. And the really important thing to say is that just because you don't have one of these genes, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not eligible for these trials, because actually increasingly not having these genes will be an eligibility criteria for, for other drugs which aren't targeting these particular pathways. But we see it as absolutely crucial to being able to deliver these trials into the future, that people get involved and get themselves trial ready, because this is definitely the direction that the field is going in, we feel. So to summarise, GBA is a really exciting area of therapeutic development in Parkinson's disease. There are multiple clinical trials targeted at the pathway, but there is a need now for people start to start to think about getting genotyped so that we can allow the delivery of these clinical trials. And PD Frontline, which is a, a study part funded by the Cure Parkinson's Trust, is hopefully our means of contributing to be able to get these trial ready, the cohorts moving forward. So thank you very much.